fan towards release. <laughs> a good release buys you forgiveness. Now the release is important because that's the last moment in the draw in which you can influence the trajectory of the arrow, for better or for worse. The concepts that I'll explain in this video are actually rather straightforward, and the, the tips and the exercises that I'll explain will help you diagnose your release in a very straightforward way. There's no mystery to it, but um, you, know, you do have to put in the work, and you'll benefit from it. Because once you have a forgiving release, then even if you're in a stressful situation, even if you only have maybe your 97 or 98% effort, you'll still get pretty close to where you need to be. Based on what happens to the draw length during the release process, we can categorize releases in one of three ways. Abrupt, collapsing, and expanding. For reference, we mark the position of the hands in blue. Before the release, both hands are holding still. The opening force of the archer, marked in yellow, is equal to the closing force of the bow, marked in red. They are in equilibrium. To release, the archer decides to apply a sudden jerk. It is unclear where their hands will go after the release because of this sudden acceleration. Here, the archer is at full draw. The opening force of the archer is at equilibrium with the closing force of the bow. However, because of tiredness or complacency, the opening force of the archer becomes less than the closing force of the bow. This is a problem. The draw length collapses, and the archer is left wondering, why did I waste that effort going to full draw, only to release at a shorter draw length? This is a more subtle form of collapse. It may look good to the naked eye, but there is in fact a problem. In addition to marking the hands, we also mark the draw elbow for reference. This will be useful for pinpointing the issue. Just prior to release, the opening force of the archer and the closing force of the bow are in equilibrium. But because the opening force of the archer is insufficient, there's going to be a split second during the release where the draw hand is dragged forward. This slight hesitation this forward hitch is enough to throw the hands off axis and disturb the release. I call this type of collapse ring drag because during the release, the ring is being dragged forward by the string ever so slightly. This is hard to diagnose with the naked eye, so what I recommend is looking at a video frame by frame, paying special attention to the position of the draw hand and the draw elbow. If it moves forward even a little bit during the release, then we have a problem. Here, the draw length is growing steadily and continuously towards release. On one side, you have the bow hand which is holding steady, because it is resisting the ever-increasing closing force of the bow by providing a proportionate counterforce. On the other side, you have the draw hand moving back steadily in a straight line. It could be a rate of 1mm per second, 2mm per second, or whatever it is, so long as it's not a sudden jerk or acceleration, and so long as you're avoiding forward collapse. Steady expansion happens because the opening force of the archer is consistently greater than the closing force of the bow. The draw hand will be able to exit the string in a straight line, or mostly straight line, because of that continuous and steady effort. Let's review what makes the abrupt and collapsing releases unforgiving, and the expanding release forgiving. The problem with the abrupt and the collapsing release is that there's this period where you're just holding the draw before release. All right, and with the abrupt release, you know, there's a sudden jerk. And if you're lucky, you can release straight back, but more often than not, it's gonna go off in some other direction, right? Your hand's either gonna go here, 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 here. Um, and it, also it could yank your bow hand off axis as well, right, with that sudden acceleration there. Um, similarly, with the collapsing release, you're holding it, and because there's that little hesitation, your draw hand is gonna kind of exit, you know, here, here, forward, up, down, to the side. 
it's going to throw the shot off. And, you know, there's a possibility that also that bow hand will collapse in the process as well. With the expanding release, you're maintaining a consistently positive force vector because the archer's opening force is consistently greater than the bow's closing force. As a result, during the release, the set of directions that the draw hand can go is much reduced compared to an abrupt release or a collapsing release. I mean, that's just physics. That's just Newton's law. What I tell my students is that an expanding release is more forgiving because it reduces the possible set of exit paths for the draw hand. Stronger expansion leads to tighter error tolerance, leads to better precision. Gawain uses the term lightness to describe the release process. Now lightness doesn't mean reach full draw and become light and weak, because that's going to lead to a collapsing release, and that's a problem. Rather, lightness refers to how the draw hand feels when you have a clean release, because the draw hand will exit the string with a light feeling. Gawain also had another metaphor to describe the release and the follow through, which is, is it's like ripe fruit falling from a tree. Because with ripe fruit, you've got gravity constantly pulling on the fruit until the breaking point, and then the fruit falls down to the ground quite naturally. And this is like the expanding release, where you're drawing constantly. There's that constant force pulling the arrow back until the release point. And then, like the fruit, the draw hand goes back naturally in a straight line. This is the horizontal flying fruit in this case. Uh, but it should be a natural reaction. This is not forced. Now you can get ground truth by looking at the video of the release on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. However, if you look at the follow-through with the naked eye, you can still get some clues as to what's happening with the release. Due to a lack of expansion, the follow-through is kind of muddy. The archer makes an attempt to cover it up with a fake follow-through here. But to the discerning eye, it's not enough. Indeed, a closer look reveals that the archer collapsed during the release. The hand is dragged forward ever so slightly, and that's due to a lack of expansion. The motion of this release looks okay, but the character is kind of soft, kind of squishy. The draw hand exits kind of at a slower pace because there's a lack of expansion prior to the release. Indeed, the draw hand is getting dragged forward at the moment of release. A lack of expansion, again, reveals itself with a soft follow-through. This is an example of a follow-through that can result from having a good expanding release. A closer look reveals that indeed this was an expanding release, free of collapse. The ending position of this follow-through has the elbow pointed down. This is what's described in Gauguin's classic text. This is the result of keeping the elbow closed throughout the draw and release process. Just remember to keep the draw hand drawing straight back in a straight line. This is another example of a brisk and crisp follow-through that can result from having proper expansion before the release. Again, this is a natural reaction. This is not forced. This might be easier for some to execute because all you really have to think about is the draw hand going in a straight line before, during, and after the release. You allow the elbow to open so that the draw hand can continue in its straight line. Whether the follow through is brisk or sluggish can help give you a hint as to whether the release was expanding or collapsing. And regardless whether you choose to have a closed follow through, an open follow through, or some other kind of follow through, you want to make sure that you have a clear expanding release. No collapse and no abruptness either. Here's a compilation of training tips that I've shared with my students that build on the previously discussed fundamentals. Classic Chinese expression. The backhand releases and the front hand doesn't realize it. What I take that to mean is that prior to the release, the draw hand is focused on moving back in a straight line for the expanding release. The rest of the body, meanwhile, is holding steady, including the bow arm and the bow hand because you've established your aim prior to the release already. So those can hold steady. 
The analogy I like to think of is, well, with a crossbow. You set the stock first, and then you press the trigger. That's the sure way to hit. And it's a useful reminder to have, especially in a pressure situation, you want to have a nice, simple reminder that kind of summarizes all the mechanics that are involved. Full draw is not the time to relax and go to sleep because that's going to lead to a collapsing release, right? If you get complacent with your expansion effort, then that's when the collapse occurs. Obviously, it's also not the time to tense up and jerk things back. Like that's going to lead to an abrupt release. Now, if you feel like you're giving it 100%, but you examine yourself later and you find that you've got a collapsing release, then what I like to tell my students is give it 120% of effort. Because you have to be well stronger than your bow in order to have consistent good expansion, smooth expansion throughout the draw. So what I like to tell my students again is, you know, you're at full draw, give it 120% effort. If you're executing positive expansion, you know, having a clear line of force between the target and your hands, then that provides you a tactile sense of aim. And that's important for quick shooting and mobile shooting situations where you don't have a lot of time to settle on things visually, right? But you can feel the line of force and where it's pointing. And if you can practice the expanding ring release as well, that gives you forgiveness even in this very quick moving situation, right? Because if you're just going to hold or you're going to collapse while you're moving around, then, you know, all bets are off. But if you can expand while taking advantage of that linear tactile sense of aim, then you'll have more forgiveness. Now, a sense of direction is also important, even in static situations. If you just get to full draw and you just focus on only squeezing the back muscles without giving your hands a sense of direction, then more often than not, in practice, you might find that your hand is dropping at the moment of release. So just think about, you know, you're using your back to expand the draw and think about giving the hands a sense of linear expansion as well. Then you'll be good to go. You'll notice I didn't say too much about the details about the draw hand fingers or the wrist or what's happening with the bow hand at the moment of release. Uh, my philosophy here is that an expanding release will help you in all of those situations, regardless of whether you're holding the bow hand uh, steady and relaxed, or whether you're trying to apply a twist or a tip, or whether the draw hand is going back like this, or this, or this, or this. A good expanding straight line will help you in any of those cases. Some ring designs allow a very quick release of the string. Others allow a more steady hold but will be a little more uh, sticky on the release. But you can overcome this with stronger expansion. Light bow, heavy bow, doesn't matter. Aspire to have a good expanding release regardless of draw weight. Now, some would argue that if you practice with a heavy bow too much, your light bow release is gonna suck because you know, you're used to expanding more opening force with a heavy bow, and so you get complacent with a lighter bow, which leads to things like collapse. Now, there, that makes a good point, but I would also argue that such a person also had a bad heavy bow release too. Because if you permit yourself to have collapse and ring drag at the heavy bow, like you say, well, it was a heavy bow, right? I'm trying my best. But if you permit yourself to do this and collapse, then you're gonna program yourself to collapse regardless of draw weight. So with any bow that you use, heavy, medium, light, uh, hold yourself to a high standard and practice a good expanding release. If you're multitasking just before release, dealing with two or more things, for example, adjusting aim and trying to expand, you're not going to do either all that well. Of course, if you're thinking about nothing, which is often the case if you just hold at full draw, then you're thinking about nothing, your mind's going to wander. And that's when the bad things, when the bad thoughts seep in, right? That's when panic occurs, anxiety, um, or you just get distracted by something else. So what I like to tell my students is, you know, you've already established your aim. Now just think about the expansion. You know, let your body focus on the expansion. Let your eyes focus on the target. That, that simplifies things. It gives you one thing to focus on 
towards release. If you treat draw and release as two discrete actions, then you're gonna get into trouble. What will often happen is that you draw and you say, okay, I'm going to release, and that might lead to collapse, or I'm going to release, and that leads to something abrupt, uh, jerking the arrow off axis. Instead, what you want to think of is draw and release as different parts of the same continuous process. And so it's important to smooth out that transition between the draw and the release. Now, if you have an oversized arrow, that's pretty straightforward. You just keep drawing and drawing and drawing until you feel maximal tension in your back, and then you keep drawing even further than that, pulling through the release. You're good to go. Now, of course, if you have a, a draw length indicator or a bow hand anchor, and there are advantages to that for consistency's sake, but if you have that, then you have a couple of options in terms of how to smooth that transition between draw and release. If you're the kind of person that has quick reactions, what you can do is release while continuing to pull back as soon as you feel the bow hand anchor or draw length indicator. Now, if you're the kind of person that has slower reactions and you happen to touch the draw length indicator a little early, don't worry, just continue pulling back for another millimeter or so and continue pulling back through the release. So here, I've reached the touch and I'm gonna continue pulling back. Some people like to be surprised by the release. I don't, because that can be misinterpreted as surprise. Right? Now, I know what they're getting at, right? which is you want to, don't want to anticipate the release and do something active to transition between draw and release. Rather, you want to focus instead on just making sure that transition between draw and release is smooth with a steady backward expansion. Nine times out of ten, people experiencing panic or anxiety before the release are actually suffering from bad release habits. What, what I've typically seen is that these folks, they'll be holding before the moment of release, right? And then that usually results in a collapse or some other sort of suboptimal release. And that results in a bad outcome. And then release and bad out outcome become associated with each other. And that further reinforces the anxiety, right? And also the fact that you're holding just before full draw, that creates kind of a void and the bad thoughts creep in. So there is a solution to that, and that involves reprogramming your physical habits first. You know, reprogramming physical habits in order to alleviate problems with mental outlook. And so what I recommend is being very diligent about practicing that expanding release. Like I said, if you're focusing on the expansion towards release, then you're giving yourself one thing to focus on, one reliable, concrete task that you can have to complete the draw, right? When, when your mind is focused on that, it is impervious to those other distractions. As far as practice habits, strive to have an expanding release on every shot that you practice, as much as possible. But as is important, make sure you end your practice on a good release. Because if you end your practices on bad releases, that's just gonna reinforce bad habits. So try to end that practice with a good expanding release so that your mind can linger on that and reinforce the good habits. A common type of panic I've seen was where the archer is able to hold at full draw if they have no intention of releasing. But when it comes time for them to release, it feels like they just don't have enough strength. Right? It's like, I'm at full draw. <clears throat> hey, I released too early. Well, do you know why that's happening? That's right. It's because they're accustomed to holding before full draw. And as I've discussed before, you know, holding can lead to collapse, bad release outcomes, bad thoughts seeping in, and you know, you're just barely getting by if you're holding at full draw. To have a proper expanding release, you need to be stronger than your bow, you know, to get the benefits of the forgiveness of an expanding release. And so what I recommend in cases like this is to develop your physical conditioning for expansion. Uh, you might have to give yourself a countdown. For example, three, two, one, zero, and then I have permission to release. And then maybe it becomes a silent count. Three, two, one, zero, permission to release. And then eventually, you know, as you develop, develop conditioning, as you program in that good habit, you don't need that count. You can just 
realize that you must expand your draw length at all points of the draw and be stronger than your bow at all points of the draw. So that's it for the tutorial. I hope you found some useful information in here. And in the meantime, have fun practicing.